Medieval India. Today we are going to discuss developments which took place in the field of religion, folk art and languages in India. These developments have been important milestones in the evolution of the composite culture of India. New religious movements like Sufi and Sikhism along with the Bhakti movement has contributed immensely to this process. If you look around, you will see the impact of Islam on many aspects of Indian culture. You might have visited some famous monuments in India. These monuments stand as the symbols of the composite nature of Indo-Islamic culture in India. You can also see how various religions in India, including Islam, have influenced each other. Besides, every region in India is famous for giving shape to some folk art or the other. Development of folk arts through which the common people display their creativity is another significant aspect of Indian culture. The various regional languages that we speak have an interesting history which evolved during this particular period. Now we shall study about the life of people under the Delhi Sultanate. When the Muslim invaders came to India, they decided to make it their home. They intermarried and took to the culture of the Indians. There was a mutual exchange in ideas and customs. In dress, speech, manners and intellectual outlook, the two influenced each other immensely. Some of these changes were in the field of society. The Indian society was divided into four major groups. They were the aristocrats, the priests, the townspeople and the peasants. The aristocrats included the sultan and his relatives, the nobility and the landholders. They were also the Hindu rajas, chiefs, Hindu merchants and bankers. These people concentrated all the wealth as well as the power in their hands. Needless to say that they were a group of very powerful people. They lived in great style and luxury. The Sultan outmatched everyone in this. He had to do it so as to maintain his superiority and his status. He had to show that he was different from the others. Whenever a new Sultan came to the throne, the khutbah or sermon was read out in his name in the Friday prayers at the mosque and coins were issued in his name. This established the new ruler on the throne. To maintain his distinction as a ruler, he was provided with many officers and servants at the royal household where he lived in great luxury. Even the nobility imitated his style and showed off their wealth. Another class of people that were important were the priests. They were the Brahmins among the Hindus and Ulemas among the Muslims. They were given grants of tracts free land for their maintenance and were often very powerful. The Ulemas wielded great influence on the Muslim Sultans as we shall find out later and often influenced their policies. But at other times, like during the reign of Alauddin Khilji, they were even ignored. Sometimes the priests were not interested in religious affairs, but were more interested in worldly affairs. Along with these people were the townspeople. In the town lived the wealthy merchants, traders and artisans. The nobility, the officers and the soldiers also stayed in the town that were the administrative and military centers. Places where the Sufis and Bhakti saints lived and places which housed important temples and mosques had become pilgrim centers. The artisans lived in their own special quarters. In fact, the weavers lived in the weavers colony, the goldsmith in the goldsmith colony. This was a general pattern for all artisans and craftsmen. These people supplied luxury goods which were also sent abroad for trade. The royal karkhanas or workshops employed these workers for producing beautiful goods which were often used as gifts 
to be given away by the Sultan. The peasants, of course, lived in the villages and were often the worst off. They paid huge taxes to the state as land revenue. Any change of dynasty had no effect on their lives. Their life continued as before. The caste system was very rigid and inter-caste marriages and inter-caste dining was totally prohibited. But exchange of ideas did take place on a large scale. Those who converted themselves to Islam did not forget their old customs. Thus, exchange of ideas and customs took place. Many Hindu customs were adopted by the Muslims, while many Muslim customs were adopted by the Hindus, like those concerning food, dress, clothing and music, besides many others. Trade was flourishing and many new towns came up to encourage trade. Some communities like the Baniyas, the Marwadis and the Multanis may trade their special vocation. The Banjaras traded in caravans and were continuously on the move carrying goods from one place to another. Delhi was the center for the incoming as well as outgoing goods. There was rice from the east, sugar from Kannauj, wheat from the Doab and fine silks from the south. Besides this, there were luxury goods like metalware, ivory, jewelry, cotton textiles and many other. Goods from outside India like East Africa, Arabia and China also came to Delhi. According to Ibn Battuta, Delhi at that time was a magnificent city. The growth of trade encouraged the use of money and at this time came into use the silver tanka that is a sort of a coin. It was the most commonly used currency and was introduced by Iltatmash. Even the system of weights that were used at that time continued to be in use until the recent adoption of the metric system. When Islam came to India, Hinduism was in vogue. But by the time, Hinduism had degenerated itself. There were superstitious beliefs, rituals and sacrifices. Brahmins had become very, very powerful and the caste system was very rigid. The people, especially the lower classes, were ill-treated. Islam was the opposite of what was in practice among the Hindus. It talked of equality, brotherhood and oneness of God. There were no dogmas in Islam. On the other hand, it had a simple doctrine and a democratic organization. The coming of Islam did not bring in many changes in the political structure of the country. On the other hand, it challenged the social pattern of society. The important result of this contact was the emergence of the Bhakti movement and the Sufi movement. Both the movements were based on the fact that God was supreme. All men were equal for Him and Bhakti or devotion to Him was the way to achieve salvation. The Muslims first came to India in the 8th century AD, mainly as traders. They were fascinated by the socio-cultural scenario in the country and decided to make India their home. The traders who came to India from Central and Western Asia carried back with them traces of Indian science and culture. As a result, they became cultural ambassadors of India by disseminating this knowledge to the Islamic world and from there to Europe. The immigrant Muslims also entered into matrimonial alliances with the local people and learned to live together in harmony. There was mutual exchange of ideas and customs. The Hindus and the Muslims influenced each other equally in dress, speech, manners, customs and intellectual pursuits. The Muslims also brought with them their religion, Islam, which had a deep impact on Indian society and culture. Let us find out more about Prophet Muhammad and Islam. Prophet Muhammad preached Islam in the 7th century AD in Arabia. He was born in AD 571 in the Quraysh tribe of Arabia. He migrated to Medina from Makkah in AD 622 and this marked the beginning of the Hijra era. According to the Muslim belief, Quran is the message of Allah revealed to Muhammad through his archangel Gabriel. It had been translated into several 
languages. The five fundamental principles of Islam were Tawheed that is belief in Allah, Namaz or prayers five times a day, Roza that is fasting in the month of Ramzan, Zakat giving of alms to the poor, Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in the lifetime. Prophet Muhammad's sayings are preserved in what is called the Hadith or Hadith. After his death, the caliphate was established. There were four pious caliphs. Islam talked of equality, brotherhood and the existence of one God. Its arrival particularly made a profound impact on the traditional pattern of Indian society. The rise of both the Bhakti and the Sufi movement contributed immensely in this regard. Both the Bhakti and the Sufi movements believed that all humans are equal. God is supreme and devotion to God is the only way to achieve salvation. Sufism is a common term used for Islamic mysticism. The Sufis were very liberal in their religious outlook. They believed in the essential unity of all religions. They preached spirituality through music and doctrines that professed union with God. Sufism originated in Iran and found a congenial atmosphere in India under the Turkish ruler. The sense of piety, tolerance, sympathy, concept of equality and friendly attitude attracted many Hindus, mostly from lower classes, to Islam. Sufi saints Nizamuddin Aliya, Fariduddin, Ganji Shakar were the pioneer Sufis who are still loved, respected and honored in India. The Sufis were also influenced by the Christian and Buddhist monks regarding the establishment of their khankas and the ragas. Khanka is the institution that is the abode of Sufis set up by the Sufis in northern India which took Islam deeper into the countryside. Mazars, that is tombs and takiyas, that is resting places of the Muslim saints, also became the centers for the propagation of Islamic ideas. They were patronized both by the aristocracy and the common people. The Sufis emphasized respect for all human beings. They were organized into religious orders or silsilas. These silsilas were named after their founders such as Chishti, Surawardi, Kadi, Nakshabandis. According to Abul Fazal, the author of the ayn e akbari there were as many as 14 silsilas in India during the 16th century. Each order had its own khanka, which served as a shelter for the Sufi saints and for destitutes and later developed as a center of learning. Ajmer, Nagor and Ajuddan or Pak Patan, now in Pakistan, developed as important centers of Sufism. These also started the tradition of Piri Muridi, that is, teacher and the disciple. In order to attain a state of mystical ecstasy, the Sufis listened to poetry and music, Sama, which was originally in Persian, but later switched to Hindavi or Hindustani. They preached the unity of God and self-surrender unto Him in almost the same way as the votaries of the Nirgun Bhakti movement did. Music attracts everybody, irrespective of language. Slowly, such music attracted the Hindus who started visiting the Dargahs in large numbers. The Hindu impact on Sufism also became visible in the form of Siddhas and yogic postures. Now, let us look into the political background during this period. The rulers of Delhi who ruled from 1206 to 90 were Mamluk Turks. They were followed by the Khaljis, the Tughlaqs, the Sayyids and the Lodhis who ruled northern India from Delhi till 1526. All these rulers were called Sultans. A Sultan was supposed to rule over a territory on behalf of the Khalifa or Caliph who was considered to be the spiritual and temporal head of the Muslims. Both the names of the Khalifa and the Sultan used to be read in the Khutbah, that is, the Friday prayers by the local Imams. 
In 1526, the Delhi Sultans were replaced by the Mughals, who initially ruled from Agra and later from Delhi till 1707 AD. Thereafter, the Mughal rule continuously started declining till 1857, when the revolt of 1857 took place and Bahadur Shah II was sent to Burma, when the dynasty ultimately came to an end. The Mughals did not ask for any investiture, but continued to send presents to the Khalifas. They also got the Khutbah read in their own names. However, Sher Shah, a local Afghan ruler, challenged the Mughal rule, Himayu, and kept him away from the throne of Delhi for about 15 years, that is from 1540 to about 1555. Sher Shah's reign stands out far more outstanding achievements. Among these was the construction of several roads, the most important being sadak e azam or the Grand Trunk Road, extending from Sonargaon, which is now in Bangladesh, to Atok, now in Pakistan, and runs through Delhi, very famously known as the GT Karnal Road, and Agra, a distance of 1500 kos. The other roads were from Agra to Burhanpur, Agra to Marwar, and from Lahore to Multan. He struck beautiful coins in gold, silver, and copper, which were imitated by the Mughal kings. The Mughal emperor Akbar, who ruled from 1556 to 1605, was a great ruler in the history of India. He made a sincere effort to foster harmony among his subjects by discouraging racial, religious, and cultural biases. He tried to develop friendly relations with the Hindus. To fulfill his imperialistic ambitions, he entered into matrimonial alliances with the Rajput rulers. His greatest contribution was the political unification of the country and the establishment of an all-powerful central government with a uniform system of administration. Akbar was a great patron of art, architecture and learning. As a secular-minded monarch, he also started a faith called Deen e Ilahi, which encompassed ideas from various religions. On every Thursday, scholars from different religious groups came to debate on religious issues raised by the emperor. This was done at the Ibadat Khana in Fatehpur Sikri at Agra. Though illiterate, Akbar patronized scholars and learned men. In his court, there were nine gems or Navratna. For example, Mullah Do Piyaza, Hakim, Humam, Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khana, Abdul Tayal, Tansain, Raja Chodarmal, Raja Man Singh, Faizi, and Birbal. Akbar's policy of liberalism and tolerance was continued by his successors, Jahangir and Shah Jahan. However, this policy was abandoned by Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb's short sighted policies and endless wars in different parts of the country, especially in South India, resulted in the disintegration of the Mughal Empire. The rise of the Marathas in the south, the invasions of Nadir Shah and Ahmad Shah Abdali, unrest among the nobility in the court, and the rise of the Sikhs in northwestern India destroyed whatever was left of the Mughal power. Economically, India was still the biggest exporter in the world and had great wealth, but it was left far behind in the process of modernization. It was in the field of art and architecture that the rulers of this period took a keen interest. The composite cultural characteristics of the medieval period is simply witnessed in these fields. A new style of architecture known as the Indo-Islamic style was born out of this fusion. The distinctive features of the Indo-Islamic architecture were the dome, lofty towers, or minarets, arch, and the vault. The Mughal rulers were great lovers of nature. They took pleasure in spending their time in building beautiful forts and gardens. The famous Mughal gardens like the Shalimar Bagh and the Nishat Bagh are important elements of our cultural heritage. There were waterways and fountains crisscrossing these gardens, and finally, there were gardens with stages or levels. The water, while cascading from one stage to another, was made to fall in small 
streamlets with lamps lit behind them, making the water shimmer and lend a special charm to the whole atmosphere. It could also be made to flow over a chiseled and sloping slab, so that the water flowing over it shimmered. The best example of this type of garden is the Shalimar Gardens of Lahore, which is now in Pakistan. The Lahore Garden has three stages, but a better example can be seen in India at Pinjor Gardens situated on the Chandigarh Kalka Road, where we have a seven-stage garden. This impressed the British so much that they created a three-stage garden in the Vice Regal Lodge, now the Rashtrapati Bhavan in New Delhi. It was in these very lines that the famous Brindavan Gardens in Mysore were built in the 20th century. The Petra Dura or colored stone inlay work on marble became very popular in these days of Shah Jahan and the finest examples of this type of work are available in the Red Fort in Delhi and the Taj Mahal at Agra. Besides the structures within the Fatehpur Sikri complex, the forts at Agra and Lahore and the Shahi Mosque in Delhi are an important part of our heritage. During this period, mosques, tombs of kings and dargahs came to dominate the landscape. Another aspect of art which is of great importance to us is connected with numismatic, that is the study of coins, which is a major source of information for any period in history. The coins of Muslim kings are valuable in history. Their designs, calligraphy and mint marks give us plenty of interesting information on this period. From the royal titles, the name and place of minting, we can find out the extent of the monarch's kingdom as well as his status. Muhammad Tughlaq's coins were minted at Delhi. Dalatabad and several other provincial capitals and had at least 25 different varieties. Some of the legends found on the coins are quite interesting. The warrior in the cause of God and he who obeys the Sultan obeys the compassionate are a few examples.